Emma Livery and AB1576, which I'm specifically choosing because we're in Los Angeles where there's still a law in the books called Measure B, which um, I hopefully explain in the piece, we'll find out. I went to Blue Stockings in Manhattan recently and left with a stack of books. One of the books was Deirdre Kelly's Ballerina, Sex, Scandal, and Suffering, but behind the symbol of perfection. It starts out exactly as salaciously as the title implies, and ends with a discussion of modern steps towards better workers' rights and healthier job conditions. Somewhere in the middle is a relatively extensive retelling of Emma Livery's story. I was prepubescent and enrolled in a significant number of ballet classes when I first heard of Emma Livery. She was so fantastically talented that the great Marie Taglioni herself was moved to choreograph Le Papillon for Livery to dance the starring role in. After performing the role of Farfalla the Butterfly, whose wings are burnt as a catalyst for the happy ending, Livery herself was burnt during a rehearsal for the mute girl of Portizzi. Her costume was set alight by the open flames of stage lighting. And she died, because it was the mid-19th century and antibiotics hadn't been invented yet which is definitely an ending, but difficult to classify as a happy one. I'm unsure about the intentions of the instructor who told me this anecdote. It could have been an attempt to instill gratitude for modern medical science or a desire to impart knowledge of a notable moment in the history of dance. My initial takeaway was that Emma Livery died, or Emma Livery, the last major dancer of the Romantic era, died in the most romantic with a capital R way imaginable. Don't act like Byron and his peers weren't the poster children for opulent morbidity. I had no idea until midway through reading Kelly's Ballerina that the French government had introduced legislation years before Livery's accident, which required costumes to be treated with flame retardant chemicals. I also had no idea that a number of dancers had refused to wear the treated tutus because the chemicals made their skirts dingy and stiff, spoiling the ethereal effect they went through years of punishing physical training to achieve. Livery, despite having witnessed the narrowly averted death by burning of one of her co-workers, was one of the dancers who wrote letters to the Paris Opera protesting the flame-resistant costumes. I insist, sir, on dancing all first performances of the ballet in my ordinary ballet skirt, and I take it upon myself all responsibility for anything that may occur, she wrote. After being set on fire by a stage light, experiencing burns on more than a third of her body, and suffering through treatments in which lemon juice was squeezed into her wounds, someone asked Livery if her opinions on flame retardant chemicals had changed. She acknowledged the increased safety, but maintained that she still would not wear them if she were ever able to return to work. Dancing in a stage production, like performing an adult film, feels like a combination of practicing the craft of performance and acting to fulfill the director's vision. The likely risks of dancing include chronic snap crackle popping of joints at a young age, maybe a fractured or broken bone here and there. The likely risks of performing in adult entertainment include ostracization by family, peers, or society at large, and difficulty securing other employment later in life. Both careers tend to have an upper age limit, typically under 35. Risks are taken and sacrifices are made for a chance of success. That success is a slim possibility, and even if it is achieved, it lasts for a very short window of time. To enter either profession is to accept the likelihood of certain harmful side effects and the risks of more serious damage. The sacrifices I've made for my work were willing, but they were sacrifices nonetheless. I would appreciate the freedom to continue evaluating which risks I feel are worth taking, which safety measures I deem most helpful in each situation. While I was reading Ballerina, I was spending most of my work hours attempting to hunt down a currently working adult performer who was pro AB1576 and willing to give me an interview regarding why. California's AB1576 bill is the latest in a string of county and state legislation geared towards forcing adult performers to use condoms and sex scenes as a prophylactic, in spite of virtual mountains of statements from performers saying that what they want is the ability to choose for themselves which safety measures to use. I never did find a performer who agrees with AB1576, much less one willing to discuss it on public record. 
I was struck by the similarities between the responses of the Paris Opera dancers and the reactions of California-based adult performers to outside legislation. I thought that I should probably be reacting to these new pieces of Emma Libri's story by taking them as a warning, but I wasn't reacting that way, and my opinion on forced barrier use at work didn't change. I just admired Emma's dedication to her work. I'm definitely not arguing for a dedicated pornography wing in the Louvre, but I would absolutely argue that adult videos are a kind of art. They are, after all, generally protected in the United States under the First Amendment. Pornography has undeniable mass appeal and speaks to one of the most basic human needs. While it frequently does cater to the lowest common denominator in an effort to be financially viable, it does occasionally produce timeless works. Consider Betty Page, who appeared in pictures which were classified as pornographic at the time and are now deemed suitable for travel mugs and refrigerator magnets. Like Emma Livery's distaste for stiff skirts spoiling her illusion of weightlessness, I dislike the idea of being forced to use barrier protection when the accompanying friction impedes my ability to deliver the best performance possible. If members of the French government had listened to the dancers they were trying to protect, they could have explored options like moving the lights two feet forward or enclosing them in cages. Maybe the real lesson here is that performers and artists will do their work in the ways they consider best, and harm reduction can only be effective when their requirements are considered first. <laughs>